Good afternoon. We're, we're joined today by Robert Primus um, joining us. Robert, I don't actually know where you are in the States at the moment. Are you in L.A. or? Uh, no, no. Uh, actually, it's Primus. Uh, just sort of uh, Primus. don't mind. No. Um, I'm, in, I'm in Washington, D.C. Okay. Um, uh, I've been here roughly 30 years um, um, and uh, grew up in New Jersey, right outside okay. New York City. But uh, here and, and, you know, working in the federal government uh, up on Capitol Hill. Congressman uh, Tony Cardenas, uh, he's from Los Angeles area. Uh, okay. um, uh, so uh, San Fernando Valley. So uh, I recently joined him, but I, I spent majority of my time uh, in the House uh, being chief of staff with uh, Congressman Mike Capuano from uh, Boston area. Uh, so his connections to uh, uh, um, uh, to, to uh, Ireland and go back to his, his family roots, uh, uh, Garvey, so sort of connection there. Right, okay. And I, I read in a much earlier article from some years ago that you were one of the few black chiefs of staff to um, a white member of Congress. Is that still the situation or has that changed any? Uh, it's still the situation. Uh, yeah. It's still challenging. It's still... Um, you know, it, I tell people it was both an honor and a disappointment uh, in the fact that uh, it, definitely an honor. I was actually the first uh, black chief of staff in the history of the Massachusetts delegation. Okay. Uh, and at the time, I was one of, of six uh, blacks who ran white offices on Capitol Hill in the House and Senate combined. Uh, so, uh, you know, yes, it was a point of pride, but it was also... Uh, rather disappointing that our numbers were not greater than they should because uh, the talent is there, yeah. uh, but the opportunity, unfortunately, uh, is not. Okay. Um, maybe if we could kick off just for our, our, our viewers on, on this side of the Atlantic and, and possibly we'll be joined by, by people in, in the U.S. as well. I think it would interest people here a lot because uh, people are glued to their, their television sets and, and watching every step of your a president, obviously, and wondering what's going to come next. And kind of, it's quite an extraordinary situation. And I was just wondering, from your perspective, uh, in, the, in the context of the Black Lives Matter campaign at the moment, and the context of COVID and the pandemic, I mean, how, how are people on the ground, particularly in the disadvantaged communities, um, which would be largely minority communities. And I, I say that against a backdrop. I, I used to work myself in, in Los Angeles, in East Los Angeles, in the Latino community. I worked with the United Farm Workers there. And I was back visiting some of the people that I knew six months ago, and they were already in a pretty bad situation. And the reports that are coming back now are, are devastating in terms of the effect of the pandemic, particularly on disadvantaged communities. Well, uh, you know, with respect to COVID, uh, you know, in, in a baseball term, you know, three strikes and you're out and, and we're beyond three strikes. Uh, you know, this pandemic has hit uh, black and brown communities, actually just uh, all communities of color. You have to include Native Americans as well as uh, Asian Americans, uh, particularly hard. Uh, we are, uh, have the highest rates of death. Uh, we, we contract the virus at, at higher rates than whites. Uh, but then you look at the economics. Uh, yeah. We are the essential workers. So we are the ones who, who don't have a choice. We have to go to work. We can't stay at home. Uh, and, and by doing so, we, we are uh, the most get at risk and, and, of, of being exposed. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the last one is, not only are we essential workers, but we're also the first ones to be let go, to be fired, to be laid off uh, during the pandemic. And so our, even though the unemployment rate is high across the board, uh, if you look at the unemployment rate within African-American communities, Latino communities, uh, Native American, Asian, it is, it is far higher than the national average. So by far, we are the most affected in an adverse way uh, with this pandemic. And yet, uh, if you look at where uh, uh, the relief money is going, if you look at where the attention is going, it is not going in these communities. If you look at, for example, uh, you may have heard of uh, the PPP loans that are given out by the Small Business Administration. Uh, uh, there was one report that said that 95% 
of black businesses and 91% of Latino businesses uh, did not have access to those loans. So you're telling me that uh, all of the small businesses, which are the lifeblood of this community, uh, actually Latinos are, are starting more small businesses than any, and yet 91% of them have no, had no chance of getting a loan. 95% of black businesses had no chance of getting a loan. And so, uh, you know, this is history repeating itself mm -hmm. time and time again, uh, even with crisis, even with issues that are going on that are, that are uh, affecting the entire country, uh, yet and still it is once again communities of color who are asked and, and, and who end up bearing the brunt uh, of this. And, you know, you've seen it microcosm in Katrina, uh, yeah. in, in Louisiana, in, in New Orleans, uh, and this is just uh, exacerbated on you know, across across the, uh, the the country. And is there a, is there a growing sense of of anger in those communities, or is there a growing sense of despair? Uh, what has that led to? How, has there been any positive change coming out of that? Or I think there's a you know honestly, as you will know, there's always been a growing sense of of, of anger. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think you know, again, you know, we wanted to be you know all Americans. You know, deserve to be treated equally, and as you well know, that that's not always the case, and it's it's readily apparent when you do have a crisis, when you do have an issue, mm -hmm. because you know you know when folks go overboard, you know who gets thrown the lifeline first, yeah, who who gets saved, you know the priority of being saved first, and time and time again, our people are left to drown, uh, uh, while others are are brought to safety. So quite, it's not literally in, in Katrina and the aftermath. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and so you know you look at what's happening, you know, at dovetailing into the the uh, the George Floyd issue. Uh, I think honestly, and still staying with 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 uh, you know storms, uh, you know this was the perfect storm. Mm -hmm. Honestly, uh, not saying that it has made uh, from the COVID issue things better. But what it has done is it brought attention to the overall and, and underarching issues that are affecting this country. Uh, you know, COVID created uh, a sort of captive audience. You know, we are all uh, uh, sort of sequestering ourselves. We are all, you know, indoors. We're not going out at the time when George Floyd happened. Many of us, uh, you know, were home with our kids, work, you know, and so when it happened, we could, you know, white America couldn't run away. They couldn't change the channel. They couldn't ignore the fact that this was right in front of their face. And, and the reality for many of them was they had to, uh, finally, for many of them, uh, uh, say, yes, this is a problem. Yes, I acknowledge it. Yes, it is there. And, and that awakening, that reckoning, I believe, has brought us to where we are now. Uh, for people of color, uh, honestly, it's what took you so long. Yeah. You know, it's, it's almost like, uh, I, I, I tell people, it's almost like they woke up and said, oh, I didn't know you, you, you were here. I didn't know you had these problems. Uh, but, but, it, but, it, it, but what it did is it, it accelerated the, the, the thinking and the hand-wringing and the conversations that have to take place now. But it also exacerbated, honestly, our, our divisions, our differences, where you have the extremes basically saying, uh, uh, for example, you know, uh, instead of Black Lives Matter, it's White Lives Matter, or All Lives Matter. And I don't think there's any dispute in the Black community that all lives do matter. It's just the fact that we're not putting Black sure. lives above anyone else. No. It's just that we need to be acknowledged that we are just like everyone else. So, you know, there was a, a quote of saying, uh, you know, when, they, when the Founding Fathers said, liberty and justice for all, they weren't including us. You know, and so that's why we have to say, you know, for those who say all lives matter, that's why we have to say, well, they didn't include all then, but let's, for us then, but let's include Black Lives Matter now. And I think that's where, you know, we're starting to move towards and, and get that awareness. But, it, but like you said before, going back to COVID, it has to be something that uh, uh, comes back to the economic conditions of, 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 the, of communities of color, Mm -hmm. uh, to the social, you know, all these conditions, to all these things that have been wrong for so long. 
to begin to move uh, uh, the bar back towards, uh, towards being right. It, it feels, I think, to people here, um, especially with what happened in Portland recently, and, and there you saw that, that maybe white demonstrators were beginning to experience something of what black uh, and, and Latino communities have gone through for years uh, of police brutality. But it also felt at least that there was almost um, what I might describe as a false curfew moment. And the false curfew happened in Belfast um, in 1970 when the British Army put an area of the Falls Road in Belfast under curfew and then basically proceeded to, to, to wreck people's homes and, and, and so on. And it was a defining moment in the relationship between the, the population and the British Army. And it feels like, well, it almost feels that what's happening in the US since Trump came to power is a defining moment every day. But also this whole idea of, of the federal troops being brought in, of the level of force of the, the central government against the state and so on. And I, I'm, I'm guessing from your perspective, maybe from what you said earlier, you're looking at that and saying, yeah, folks, now you're going through what we've gone through. Would that be correct or? Uh, you, it, it's, uh, it, for me, it's complicated and I'll be, be very honest with you. You know, Portland itself has a very, very troubling history with respect to, to, to black Americans. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of its history, I mean, Oregon in itself, I mean, there was a law in Oregon that, you know, allowed, this is, you know, back in the 1800s, that allowed whites to literally beat blacks on a given day. Uh, you know, and the idea of gentrification and, you know, within Portland and other issues, I mean, as, as liberal as Portland is, and it is, and progressive as it is, they have their own past to, to deal with yeah. uh, and, and reckoning with their own black community uh, as well. It's, it's similar. I don't know if you read the, the op-ed from the Minneapolis mayor, former mayor, that said were, that, that white liberals were as much a problem, you know, as anyone else in terms of stopping that. And I think that's the case. But going back into the, to, from the protest side, I, I think what it did do, uh, I think it did open people's eyes up because, you know, it wasn't, you know, you know federal troops against uh, predominantly uh, um, African Americans or people of color. It was against uh, 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 whites, and you know it was. I believe it was an egregious use of, of federal power. Uh, I think that uh, uh, just like it was in, in uh, honestly in Washington D.C. during some of the protests when uh, President Trump unleashed the National Guard and, and the helicopters were flying overhead, and and even the the uh, uh, force removal. A peaceful protester from Lafayette Park just so he could walk to to a church uh, uh, where he literally was uninvited and, and, and snap a picture. Yeah. Uh, it, it is a, a, an obvious abuse of power uh, and you know I, I actually do think that having it happen in Portland, having it happen to, to, uh, to white Americans, I think it, it does start to wake people up to the reality that uh, you know, this administration uh, has gone beyond uh, uh, really its, its, its authority. And, and it, it, well, let me back up. It does have the authority to do it, but in terms of how it, it prosecutes this authority, I think, you know, calls into question uh, this administration and, and how it, it, it believes it has the ability to, frankly, do what it wants. Yeah. I, I want to go back for a minute uh, uh, to the issue of the, the whole Black Lives Matter movement and, and how whites are now getting affected because there's a lot of controversy here in Ireland and also in Irish America about uh, this issue of people producing like T-shirts um, that Irish Lives Matter. Uh, you can buy them in Walmart in the US, mm -hmm. you can buy them on Amazon and so on. And there's a lot of concerns here that there are people within Irish America, and there's also people in Ireland. There, there, there's, there's, there is racism in Ireland. We need to be clear about that because we often pride ourselves on being, um, you know, showing solidarity with oppressed peoples around the world and, and being, you know, great uh, uh, at solidarity. But we do have our own major problems here, and, and, and the new migrant Irish would tell you that, uh, and, and it, it manifests itself on a, on a daily basis. But this idea of, of um, some people within Irish America claiming that there were also Irish slaves and we were just as bad off and Irish lives matter. I was wondering what your thoughts are on that because 
I, I, it seems from our perspective, we have a responsibility to do a job in terms of Irish America, who have had not inconsiderable um, involvement in policing Black America and Latino America, and and they certainly haven't come out of that uh, with glowing col colours. Well, yeah. <laughs> Being in America for a long time, from in my opinion, especially from from a, a white immigrant's perspective, uh, you know, you you have two choices. You can either I uh, you know assimilate and, and embrace uh, the culture that exists, uh, or you can come in and 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 try to live out, you know, the true creed and and, and understanding of what this country you know was was formed upon. Uh, you know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and, and you know, everyone created equal. Uh, I think, honestly, historically, when most came, uh, even though they were fighting their own oppression uh, here and maybe even at home, in their home country, uh, many of them found a common thread in the discrimination and the oppression of, of Black Americans and other people of color here. Mm -hmm. They figured, well, if, if if everyone else seems to be, you know, of the mindset of this, then then we'll be of the mindset of this too. Uh, and I think that that indoctrination, that that uh, uh, of that mindset, I think that's where you see, you know, the problems exist, and when people will raise those issues about, well, what about, uh, you know, Irish Americans, and what about Polish Americans, and what about, you know. Uh, German Americans, and you can go down the list of, of those who come here and 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 been a part and and allowed to assimilate, allowed to become true Americans. You know, many of these folks who come sure. and you know, within time of them being citizenship, they were voting before we were voting. They were having access to to educate uh, to better education than we were. Uh, that than many of my ancestors who were here, you know, hundreds of years before. Mm -hmm. and, and had done more to build this country than anyone else. And yet uh, many of those rights were, were continue to be, to, to have been denied and continue to be denied today. And so there, there has to be this understanding uh, that uh, uh, just as there were many, many, many uh, uh, white Americans and, and Irish and others from other nations who were helpful uh, not only in the civil rights, you can go back to, to, to slavery, abolitionists, or others. Uh, the, you know, the sad reality uh, was there weren't enough of them to continue the efforts of, of, of uh, freedom, equality, civil rights, and human rights. Uh, so, you know, we end up having a George Floyd in 2020. We end up having a Breonna Taylor in 2020. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, and all these issues continue to go. Or what we said before about covid and, and, and the, the uh, policies, uh, unequal policies, of, you know, economic policies that, that befall uh, communities of color. So it's still out there. And I think, again, people have to be honest with that. And, and they have to, to, to understand that, uh, you know, you personally may not have been uh, a part of the problem, but as a culture, uh, uh, your culture was. And so you have to work towards uh, remedies and reconciliation in that, you know, regardless if you yourself did it, you have to understand that you benefited from that society. Uh, uh, and now, you know, you have a reckoning of whether or not you are going to, you know, come and be part of the solution. And do you think that there are people within Irish America that are now part of the solution? Uh, is that oh, absolutely. The or? Absolutely. I, I yeah. think it's, it's across the diaspora. I, I believe that. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Congressman John Lewis, who recently passed away, uh, was actually a friend of mine. And uh, his last words, which were in the New York Times, uh, you know, I commend anyone to, who has an opportunity to read it uh, online. You know, he talked about you know, uh, uh, that this struggle is not just our struggle. It, it has gone on for centuries and it's gone on around the globe. And there are many people uh, who, who have, uh, who have, you know, had like experiences, you know, may not have been necessarily enslaved and, and the issues, but, you know, the issues of being treated like second class citizens, of having your, your human dignity and your human rights in question, your civil rights. So the idea of, of 
of, uh, of Northern Ireland and, and, and the struggles that, that, that they went through and the uh, discrimination and the, 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 the inhumanity that, that happened, uh, there are parallels. There are absolute parallels to that. And, and even the idea uh, uh, of, of, you know, peaceful nonviolence, it's the same thing. You know, you can find that. You know, you know, in the history books in, in places like Northern Ireland, as well as, you know, other places, well, India and other places around the world. So uh, uh, I think that, yes, uh, there are plenty of, of not just, you know, uh, Irish Americans, but, but uh, 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 white Americans across the board who generally, uh, genuinely are concerned and want to help. I mean, that's exactly why we were able to be successful during the civil rights era. We, did, we weren't successful just because blacks alone, you know, you know pushed, the, pushed the needle forward. Uh, we did it in tandem with everyone, uh, uh, not just here, but around the world. And, and uh, you know, likewise, our struggle is not our struggle. Our struggle is everyone's struggle. Yeah. And, and, and until, until everyone wakes up and realizes that and, and begins to move forward. And I, you know, honestly, I'm encouraged by uh, the amount of young uh, uh, whites who, who seem to have woken up. I'm encouraged by, by all of them, middle-aged and even some older, who understand that too. I mean, I never thought, and this is being very honest and very candid, I, would, I never thought I'd live to see uh, the Mississippi state flag lowered, never to, be, to, 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 to rise again above that state capitol. Uh, I never thought I'd see... Uh, and this isn't even dealing with African Americans, but communities of color. I never thought I uh, would would see uh, so soon, you know, our Washington American football team, you know, remove its name, especially after just five years removed after the uh, or so removed after this, the 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 owner said he would never do that. I I, I generally try not to repeat even repeat the name of, of the team now, but but those type of things that have happened in the wake of Floyd, uh, I mean, unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. The, 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 the communication you see, you know, even corporate America now trying to get on board. You see so many other people who you, you never would have seen before now talking about, you see, again, rallies in Ireland and, and, and Germany and, and Africa and Asia uh, uh, about this. Uh, in Australia, you see people speaking up now who are afraid to speak up. So I think it was, it, this, this is a bellwether moment. Uh, you know, I'm encouraged by it. I want to see it, what's going to happen, you know, in the future. I don't want to see this as something where, you know, you go and put up a sign, you pat yourself on the back, but then you go back to, to your segregated community uh, and, and think about it no more. This has, that has to end, and, and we have to understand that, that this is uh, uh, our, our own global emergency not just the COVID pandemic, this is our own global emergency that we have to, we need to not, we need to wake up and we need to address, you know, if we are to save ourselves. I mean, that's, I find that very inspiring, Robert, and, and thanks for that, it's, it's um, positive as well. And, and I wonder, there, there was a um, documentary on Irish language television here this week, uh, it's called TG Car is the name of the television channel, and um, it was about, among other things, the green book that was used um, by uh, African Americans when they had to go travel along Route 66 because there were so few places they could stay in, there were so few places they could use the restroom, there were so few places they could stay overnight and so on. Fascinating program. So it was a documentary that was on this week. But one of the points I think that somebody made in the program was that one of the things that's changed today is everybody's got a camera today. So mm -hmm. And of course, for us, a defining moment here was at the first civil rights march, when people were beaten by the police, um, there were cameras, there were television cameras that went around the world, which is obviously what is happening now, is what, that we're seeing um, in real time what's happening in Portland, we're seeing what's happening in different cities and, and so on. And there's a lot that we're not seeing as, as, mm -hmm. as well. And of course, the other side of social media is the use of social media by the, by the, by the far right. But it is interesting to see that. Um, just this last week here in Derry, we ha took part in a web seminar with people from Detroit from the Black Lives Matter campaign. And they were joining together with the Bloody Sunday families in Derry and with the people from the Museum of Free Dairy. 
and find common ground. Some of the Detroit people have been over here before, uh, obviously, the lockdown. And so I, w- I would hope it's not directly a question, but I would hope that out of those kind of links, that maybe there can be influencing going on also on Irish America because it's such an important commun- uh, community when it comes to this particular issue. I mean, I've, I've watched the St. Patrick's Day March in New York, and I think it's appalling. I think it's a terrible parade because it's just... It's really just men in uniform of all the different types of uniforms they have. There's nothing creative about it, but it's that link between Irish America and, and policing. And that's the link that I think we need to be looking at and challenging, particularly we as Irish people need to be doing that. Well, yeah, you know, and, and that's an excellent point. And, and it goes back to what I, what I said. It's, you know, we based our relationship, you know, you know the Irish relationship, uh, even with the African-American is is uh, based on perception in this country, and and you know looking at again St. Patrick's Day parade, but that is nothing, you know. That, there's no comparison. You can't make that comparison based on a parade. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's all about again. It's about understanding each other, uh, uh, understanding the history, you know, of this country and and not of this country but of this world, the struggles in this world. Uh, to be very blunt with you, uh, they don't teach uh, um, very rarely, you know, anywhere, you know, museums or other, the history and the struggle of what happened in Northern Ireland. They don't teach that here. Yeah. And we don't understand that. Uh, uh, you know, it has to be done, you know, unfortunately, just like you said, through exchanges. I understand it personally because of my personal relationship with so many others uh, uh, from uh, Northern Ireland who have been, who have been involved in, in the struggle, and, you know, and, and I learn and grow from that. And I have that appreciation there and vice versa. Yeah. Uh, and I think that is how, if there's any way to build upon that is, is we have to, 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 again, peel away the, the misconceptions and the stereotypes that exist today about not just, you know, about not just black Americans, but also about Irish yeah. and what has happened there. And, and what is going and and that and, and the synergies that that are are, are between the two cultures and, and and the people in terms of just like you know for example I, you know I love your shirt mm-hmm. but I doubt very many people understand what that shirt means and where it comes from you know I know in in cities like Baltimore in the 50s and 60s you know there were signs that said no blacks no dogs and no Irish yeah you know I understand that I I, I know that but most people don't and they don't understand the connection that not only did they not want blacks there, but they didn't want Irish. And not only did they not want blacks and Irish there, but they compared them to dogs. Yeah. And so you have to understand that there is a connection. And, and there today, is- today that connection that needs to be made is obviously they don't want Syrians. They don't want refugees. They don't want migrants. Right. They don't want the boat people coming across the Mediterranean. Which, which is everything that, that, you know, the Irish people and, and, and blacks or even Afghans, you know, uh, were and are. We, all, we, we are all of those, you know, when, 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 I, when Irish were coming to this country and continue to come to this country, to the United States. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. Uh, uh, you know, when blacks were coming from, from Africa, uh, like I said you had, you know, Syrians from Syria and others. It, it's always been that way. Mm-hmm. But the sad reality, it's always also been uh, uh, um, a methodology of scapegoating these individuals uh, yeah. uh, and, 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 and looking at them as, as less than instead of, you know, embracing them as, as brothers and sisters and, and as equals. So there's always been that. And I think, again, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge we have that is shown with George Floyd is that, well, it, it's not just a challenge, but it's also... Uh, uh, an encouragement that more and more people are now waking up to the reality that such uh, injustice exists. And it's up to us who, who are aware of it to help them become educated. I think that's the biggest thing when I said, you know, where do we go from here? The biggest thing I think can, that can happen is that individuals re-educate themselves uh, uh, to the realities of not just this country and the, and the injustice that happened with uh, people of color in this country, but around the world, understanding again, what using uh, Mr. Lewis's words, uh, understanding that you know there is a common thread, 
you know, you know, we are not limited to, to, you know, it was just us who, who were unjustly uh, uh, treated. It is throughout the world and it continues today throughout. And I think there's a problem that, 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 that there's a problem that we have uh, uh, in terms of isolating ourselves, even in that injustice. You know, and not understanding that, you know, if you know, we can't be free if, for example, you know, uh, Northern Ireland can't be free. Northern Ireland can't be free if, uh, uh, you know, the Rohegans, you know, you know, you know uh, Rohegans can't be free. You know, if, if, if you know, the Aboriginals in, in, in Australia can't be free. You know, you know it, it's, it's a common threat. Yeah. You know, uh, and we uh, have uh, to uh, embrace uh, that. Absolutely. Um, we'll be finishing off soon, Robert. One thing is, I just want to maybe on a more personal note, I think I heard the children in the background just now. And you yes. Know, <laughs> and one of the things I'm struck by, um, and it goes to the very heart of what is racism, uh, you know, if I lived in Washington, D.C., now I've got kids, although they're grown up, I wouldn't need to warn them about interactions with police whenever they're leaving the house. But I think that's a living reality for you and for every African-American family, is it not? That you will teach your son and daughter or whoever, I, I don't know, um, things that they need to know to survive in terms of being on the street and interacting with, with police officers. Is not that the case? Well, unfortunately, it's not just police officers. It's life in general in this country. Uh, I have three. I have three boys: uh, Benjamin, who's eleven; Jacob, who is nine; and Aaron Francis, who you heard, is uh, four. Uh, but there's not a day goes by that I don't un uh, worry about. As a matter of fact, uh, my how I raise my boys it is is you know is done for that for that reason. You know, I'm going to raise a respectful, upstanding. Uh, you know, men who will turn into to my uh, uh, prey and turn into to grown men, uh, but they will understand that the society will will always uh, see them differently, and they have to be able to adjust and adapt to that. Uh, and, and again, yes, in the police officers, but when we encounter, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know that when we see police uh, in our neighborhood, um, we walk up to them. And I've taught my boys to, to say, to, to, say, to tell them to thank you for keeping our community safe. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's a lesson in that. And it's the, the lesson is that I want my boys to understand that, that not all police are, are bad and, and we should respect them when they're doing their jobs. But I also want the police to understand that not every uh, uh, black boy that they see is a threat and is disrespectful and, and, and is not thankful for them when they are doing their jobs. And so it not only teaches my boys a lesson, uh, it also hopefully teaches those officers a lesson that when they leave and when we leave, that they can no longer stereotype and say, well, all of them are this way and all of them act this way. But they can say, well, there were three boys who weren't and a father who, who wasn't. And so, you know, there is that struggle. And I think about it every day. I think about it about me. Yeah, no, I'm uh, sure. Uh, uh, about, you know, you know, whether or not, you know, for, 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 you know, if I'm going to be stopped, how I'm going to react, what's going to happen. And again, I, I am a very successful, you know, white collar, you know, professional who, you know, works in the halls of Congress, but yet I'm not immune to that. Yeah. And so, so, so yes, I mean, we, we, I teach them about that and about their history and about who they are. Uh, and, and I know we're short on time, but you mentioned the Green Book. And, you know, about places where you can go, and what you can do. We don't have a green book today, but we do, you know, keep in mind places that have been hostile to, to, to African-Americans or people of color or to a way of life that, that we believe in terms of being able to be free. You know, just, you know, we look at social media, we look at, uh, mm -hmm. you know, read those stories where, you know, you see towns that, uh, you know, uh, um, seem to be very, you know, anti-inclusiveness. Uh, we see, you know, cities or areas that have known to be, you know, uh, um, unaccommodating and, and uh, intolerant. And so for us, those are issues where, well, maybe we won't be going there. 
You know, yeah. maybe we won't be, you know, we're, you know, a, you know, a white family can still pick up the, the, you know, pack their kids in and say, we're just going to drive across country and see where we land. Yeah. Well, you know, we can do that too, but you, you best believe that in the back of my mind, I will be thinking, you know, where are we? What yeah. are we doing? You know, how do we behave? You know, and make sure that, that you know, we come across uh, to, to others in a way that is non-confrontational. Yeah. So even to this day, we still have that. Yeah. Um, I suppose to finish off, Robert, and, and I've, I really appreciate your time. It's been a, a fascinating discussion. Um, to finish off, I, I, it's a momentous year. Uh, you've got an election coming up. You, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. There's more Americans have died in the pandemic than died in every war since World War II. I understand, um, you know, there's, there's, there's some positive manifestations in terms that we noticed here in terms of community and people working together supporting each other, getting a, a real understanding of what essential worker means and realizing who that is. For you, do, do you despair for the future or are you hopeful that in the long term, you know, I suppose it's short term or we're going to get rid of Trump? <laughs> um, and, you know, where are we headed? Because in many ways, what happens in the US does have an effect, obviously, on the rest of the world. And they're scary uh, times in a lot of ways. As a parent, uh, without question, I have to be optimistic. I have to be hopeful. And not for me, I have to be hopeful for, for, for my three boys. Absolutely. Uh, again, is there worry? Uh, is there great concern? Is there fear? Yes. Uh, but in the end, uh, again, looking at, at uh, listening to, to uh, you know, Mr. Lewis and his words, uh, you know, there is optimism for the future. Uh, I am encouraged again by uh, you know people who have been who had been silent and on the sidelines uh, before who are now stepping into uh, uh, this and and as he, as Mr. Lewis said you know getting into good trouble uh, uh, I, I see more that more and more happening like you said in Portland and so many other cities and, and even small towns where people are stepping out and, and at, you know, risking their own safety and health and, and, and well-being to stand up and say, this is wrong. And so with that, I have to be encouraged. Uh, you know, and, and you can see the powers uh, that be, you know, the Trump administration and others are pushing hard against it, mm -hmm. very hard against it, you know, trying to scare you know, their base and, and, and those who might believe him that, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, is, is, is coming for their, their families and their, their neighborhoods and the communities and their way of life. Um, you know, so we, that opposition has not left. But again, I, I, I hope that America chooses uh, love over hate, chooses uh, 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 acceptance uh, over rejection and, and uh, uh, you know, brings an administrative change to this country. You know, uh, I think, I think, uh, I hope that uh, the president's time has expired in November. Uh, and I hope to see uh, a new beginning. It, but I caution people in saying that even with him losing, even with a change in the administration, we still have work to do because there are still people out here who still believe him they believe his rhetoric. They believe uh, his xenophobic words. They believe you know, his, his racist words, uh, his sexist words, and, and they will still exist whether he's president or not. And we have to remain vigilant. We have to remain dedicated to, to, to uh, uh, civil rights, human rights, equality for all, uh, uh, well past this well past this, his administration. And so um, long story short, like I said, I, I am encouraged even the fact that we are having this conversation is encouraging because, you know, I, I even, I, I would not imagine that we would be having this had it not been for, for George Floyd. So, so here we are. And, yeah. and I think, you know, I, I hope that we have many more conversations like this. Yeah. yeah. On those cautious but optimistic notes, um, I want to thank you and thank you on behalf of the, the, the FELA committee. Um, I, I'm sure they could put that speech up from uh, John Lewis because that, is that the speech that he wrote before he died and said publish this after my death? Yes, it's the, yeah. it's the speech yeah. that, that uh, 
he wrote before. before yeah. Yes. Okay, I'm sure they could put it up on the FELA website for um, our viewers to, 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 to read again and draw inspiration from. And um, Well, I, I, just, I, I know we're closing, but I, I hope they do, and I hope they also realize that you know, John Lewis, people look at him now as an, he was 80 years old, but John Lewis began speaking out and getting into good trouble when he was 18 years old. Yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't 30, he wasn't 40 or 50, he was 18 years old. Yeah. And so for, for those young activists and those young people who think that, you know, they might not, you know, what can they do? How can I get in, engaged? You know, read about John Lewis and, 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 and understand that he was someone like them uh, who said at 18, I'm tired and I'm ready to fight for, for, for justice and equality. And I think, you know, that's what some of the, a lot of these young kids are, are doing, and I commend them for doing that. Great. Fine, fine words. Okay, so uh, I wish you a good, a good uh, fight and good trouble. Thank you. And, and, and you as well. And, yeah, okay. Thanks a lot. It was a real pleasure. Thanks. Yes, let's stay in touch. Thank you. Okay. Bye.